And it's my very great pleasure to be the one to introduce Professor Prudence Carter, who has come from Berkeley University in California. Um, so, you know, so saving the best till last. Now, I don't, make, don't want to make promises and put pressure on you, but, but uh, from what I've seen of Prudence so far, what I know about her work, uh, we're in for a treat. Prudence's uh, research focuses on solutions to and causes of social and economic inequalities in school and in education. And she's undertaken a range, a considerable range of research on youth identity, culture, race and gender. She's got some really nice, catchy, memorable titles of books, so I hope you can remember them. Um, she's written uh, Keeping It Real, School Success Beyond Black and White, uh, an award-winning book. And she's also written Stubborn Roots, uh, Inequalities in Culture, Race, and in, in the US and South Africa. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from her. I was, we were delighted in our centre when she agreed to come. None of us had met her. We knew of her work and we're very pleased that she's come to take the risk on us and joining our uh, conference on borders and boundaries. So everybody give a warm welcome, please, to Prudence Carter. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you, Joe. Thank you for that warm introduction. Um, I am so happy to uh, be able to join you. It's my first time to Lancaster, so I appreciate the, the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here, and I, am, I really appreciate the hospitality. You've been so wonderfully warm and, and, and receptive. I also, before I get started, I would like to say congratulations to England on your win in the World Cup last night. I was wondering why the streets were so empty and quiet. I'm not a big soccer fan, but I turned on the television and I said, oh, that's it. Uh, so I am really excited um, for England and good luck in the uh, subsequent rounds. So my talk today focuses on a synthesis of research that I have conducted, which I feel is very much aligned with the conference theme, which is borders and boundaries. And I specifically, as a cultural sociology, sociologists work on the topic of social and, and symbolic boundaries, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But for first, for those of you, and I imagine most of you are unfamiliar with my research, my scholarship, so I want to say that I am a sociologist. I was trained at Columbia University in New York City, the likes of Rod, Robert Merton and Robert S. Lind and Helen Lind and C. Wright Mills and so uh, Paul Lazarsfeld. Um, and uh, Herbert Gans, the great ethnographer. So these are the people who have shaped my kind of sociological imagination, so to speak. And um, I'm, I'm also very much situated in the Chicago School of Sociology because I believe very much, as you do, I've seen quite a bit of it here at the uh, conference of those of you who participate in qualitative research and interviewing and conduct ethnography. But I'm both a survey researcher and an ethnographer, and so that uh, will speak to the kind of mixed methods that I will be presenting to you today. I specifically am an inequality researcher who is focusing on how historic racial formations in global society have left a legacy and concretized the class and status hierarchies, which we all find ourselves embedded in, we continue to be embedded in generation after generation, and by their very nature, hierarchies encompass borders and boundaries. They produce the material and cultural substance that signify and illuminate what we call the us versus them, the various group statuses or categorizations that we utilize in our day-to-day -day research, particularly social scientists of various sorts. I draw on history and economics and sociology and psychology in my work to advance the arguments that I will actually present to you today. And by the way, I'm not missing the historical irony of this very day, July 4th. It is the 242nd birthday of the United States of America. Um, I, I'm not a big celebrant because my ancestors weren't necessarily independent 242 years ago. I am the daughter of or the descendant of African slaves, so, um, you know, but we acknowledge it, and I'm standing here in England on the 242nd. So I acknowledge that. But um, 
I, I write and think a lot about racial and, and class inequality in global society. I see these as twin, interdependent, what I call fraternal twin forces. They're interdependent. They are not exactly the same. They have some autonomy, but they stem and originate from similar sources, and they have a lasting, a long-lasting and enduring impact on the kind of shape of society that we see today, and particularly as it manifests in social institutions like education, we think about our economy and various um, other, the political uh, sphere and various other parts of society. So I'm going to talk about this notion of boundaries, and, and particularly from the macro to the micro, and I want to share a little bit about what my conceptual design is. There are three kind of conceptualizations I'll talk about today. The macro being understanding the socio-historical and political phenomena, which are associated with the material, the accumulated material advantages and consequences or disadvantages that confront social groups in our societies who then come to schools. To think about this, these forms of forces as also a categorization tools that engender boundaries that can reinforce exclusion, segregation, and discrimination. And so we've talked some, I, I've just in the talk where the gentleman talked about segregation. And then third is we think about racial and class inequality as, a, as, as an idea system, as, as actually shaping idea systems, what we call cultural narratives and scripts as we think about ideologies about various groups, ideologies about education and who should have access to what, as we think about stereotypes, all of these different things um, in terms of how we read one another at the, at the micro level in classrooms between teachers and students, students and students. So I want to talk about how inequality can manifest itself from the broad macro, that which we see uh, ourselves as not being able to do that much about, but which we can, to the very micro, which every day each of us is participating in a system of ideas and a system of practices that can either collude or reproduce the forces of race and inequality. So let's start with the first one. Um, and this is, I just want to share with you some kind of macro contextual material conditions in the U.S. and South Africa. I'll draw on South African research. I, I conducted a comparative study of eight schools in four cities in the U.S. and South Africa back um, several years ago, and I'll be drawing on that research for the most part to talk about these ideas. I want you to know that even today in 2018, it is a, it's kind of the norm where two-thirds of African American, um, what we call Hispanic or Latino or Latinx students, and Native American, those who are indigenous, now are born of two-thirds of children or youth under the age of 18, live within 200% uh, of the poverty line in the United States. Compared to their uh, white and Asian peers who are about only about a third, live within 200% of the poverty line. So the red is low income, meaning within 200% of the poverty, the national threshold, and the poor is actually those who are below the poverty line. So you'll see that roughly uh, nearly two-thirds of these three groups, and it's not surprising that those three groups, African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, are also the descendants, the youth, of those who were most adversely affected by settler colonialism, by slavery, by conquest in American society. Um, when we look up, think about Asian American students, many of them have, uh, depending on the different ethnic groups, have been in the United States for certainly um, decades, centuries, but most recently we're, we're looking at the, those who are the descendants of the post-1965 immigration wave, and many of those students are actually come from parents of very high human capital, uh, highly co college educated. Um, so that's important to know for the macroeconomic context in the United States. Another thing to point out when I talk about the interdependent twins, uh, the fraternal twins, race and class are not the same in the United States. If you look at, I'll, I'll, I'll translate this graph for you, you'll see that this is the actual the median household income in U.S. dollars of the average individual who earns each of these dollars, $20,000, $50,000 and $100,000 a year. The average individual, household income rather. And this is the median household income by race. So let's look at the highest end. The average household, which is an, uh, you know, actually this is middle, upper middle class in most American cities, $100,000. You'll see that it's actually quite stratified even by race, even if your family earns, brings in the same amount per year. The same is on the lower end at $20,000, although the gaps are not quite as wide as they are here, and then even in the middle income. So 
Um, we see that in this, I show this graph to show you that race really still is a very powerful and independent force in American society, even when we kind of equalize the household income um, in the society. And a lot of that has to do with accumulated consequences of disadvantage historically. What do I mean by that? Um, this next graph will tell you this most graphically in the United States context. Here are, by race, the median wealth of an ad average individual. You'll hear this statistic oftentimes. These are folks who have less than high school graduation, high school, some college, and college. The light blue is white, the dark blue is, is uh, black or African American, and the gray is Hispanic. What you'll notice here is that the average college graduate who is African American in American society has less wealth than the average white who has less than a high school graduation in the U.S. This is a stunning statistic. It's something like 13 to 1 in terms of overall wealth. Why does that matter? Where did it come from? How did it happen? And we often advance the argument that educational attainment really is the thing that reduces inequality in a global society, in American society, in a democratic society. Well, we have to actually take into account what happened historically. Post-World War II, when the GIs arrived back from the war, from Europe, the United States government actually established a number of programs to incorporate, to integrate those GIs into the society to make life better. And it led to the burgeoning of the American middle and upper middle classes. Those GIs, according to the GI Bill, they were given access to college educations, loans and mortgages to, to, to start to own homes. And it's in those homes that wealth started to be built and those proceeds could be passed on intergenerationally. Because of racialized forces, because of racism and discrimination in American society sanctioned by the federal government, those GIs who were of color, African American, Latino, and Native American, did not have access to the same kinds of resources. Now, legally, by law, they could actually get use the GI Bill to go to college, but because of segregation and discrimination in the higher education system, they couldn't actually utilize. There was no one who was going to accept them in the southern states where most African Americans were. Um, and also, because of what we call redlining, very bad practices in, in, in banks and mortgages, they were not allowed to actually get access to owning homes. So the consequences, the accumulated disadvantage that uh, started post-World War II, it's a missed moment, I argue in my research, in American history to fundamentally recalibrate the opportunity system. It was a missed moment. And we missed it and we now see consequently when we go back to these kinds of data um, what the long term is. So research shows now it would take something like a century if we really wanted to catch up and reduce the inequality by wealth by, in terms of race in the society. But that would uh, assume that um, whites uh, would not actually advance very much because you'd have to try to close the gap really radically. South Africa. You know, in 2004, um, sorry, um, well, in 2004 is actually when I first went to, to South Africa. 1994 is when apartheid was toppled in American society, I'm sorry, in South African society. I'm going to show you just quickly some, some statistics about where we are today. This ranges from 2006 to 2015. And we're looking at the poverty rates by racial groups in this country. So South Africa is an interesting comparison to the U.S. because the converse of this percent, proportion of population by race, they have the converse of the U.S. So majority African nation, roughly similar percentages. We have majority white nation, um, and about 9% uh, about of the population is white. And then you have those who are colored, the second largest group, and those who are Indian Asian in the society. You'll see that there has been some decline in the poverty rates, but inequality is rampant in South African society. And a large part of that has to do, there was no reallocation or redistribution of resources when apartheid was toppled in 1994. The country has been struggling. Uh, there's high unemployment rates, um, even with some skill level, and you can find various data online about this. So why does this matter? When we talk about race and class inequality in global societies, it is important for you to have the macroeconomic and macro historical political context to then understand what trickles down, what permeates the walls of schools, uh, and, and, and what permeates the, uh, and, and is pervasive on the streets of neighborhoods in our society, and why we may have the situations that we have. 
So uh, that's going to lead me, that macro context, to think about the continual categorizations, the social boundaries that reinforce exclusion in our society, that impede or minimize our ability to reduce the opportunity gaps, the mobility gaps in our society. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about what I call relational inequality behind school walls. And I'm drawing on the work of the sociologist um, at Harvard University, my, my former colleague Michelle Lamont and her student Virag Molnar, and a number of other sociologists, I don't have their full names this long, but if you want to take a picture of the slide or I can share this, there are a number of people who've written about these different kinds of boundary formations within our society. Social boundaries, how we define those, is those objectified forms of social differences that lead to the unequal allocation of resources in our society. The, the classification systems that we have, I've been drawing on those just in the mere talk of race and class. Um, in the very few minutes I've been talking. The symbolic boundaries, they argue, are the actual tools, the cultural tools we use as individuals to monopolize those resources to distinguish across these various borders, to distinguish the, to, uh, the us from them. And so we use symbolic boundaries in everyday uh, language, in everyday life, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. And it is through the processes of othering that we maintain boundaries in our society. Uh, we can talk about them, and that's from the subordinate to the superordinate. We can talk about the them through various formations. And so, Burden, Welsh, Schwab, Goodwin, Holden, Schrock, C Sheely, Thompson, and Volkmuller all talk about boundary boarding. There's a very good paper of the various forms of processes of boundary maintenance through othering that are used. So in my own research, um, based on the empirical work, and I'll get to the methods in a minute, I'm going to argue and preview that we have to consider multiple dimensions of schooling and educational inequality by thinking about the idea that schools comprise dual structures. They comprise the material, which I've talked about, the socio-cultural, um, which I'm going to get into some data about, and that our school practices can reproduce social and symbolic boundaries, um, sometimes unintentionally, unwittingly, but often we are colluding in those practices through the kind of in the United States and South Africa, it's often through racial boundary maintenance that happens. It's through the organization of students in terms of the classes they take. Uh, we often have tracking in the United States, and that's racialized in class. The ideologies that are latent and, and embedded within the schools, policies and codes. Um, and students themselves maintain these boundaries, and you'll hear them uh, talk about this in a moment. So in my own conceptualization, I've, this is something from my Stubborn Roots book, I've argued that while we've spent a great deal of time trying to fix the problem of inequality in schools through attacking the material, I argue that we have to pay more attention to the socio-cultural context, the substance of relationships, the, the, what I call the organizational racial habitus within schools, I, I actually engage with Pierre Bourdieu quite a bit in my work, the approaches to inclusion and diversity, the interactions and attitudes, thank you, and the nature of social and symbolic boundaries. All of those practices, all of these things, the substance of relationships had some in, uh, influence on the shape of policies and practices and ultimately on student outcomes. And this is what I've argued uh, in my work. Um, let me just talk, and I can go into detail. I know that you like to know, and I'm, I, try, I, I, I like to think of myself as a very rigorous uh, thinking researcher, but I want to spend more time on the data. This was a mixed methodological pro uh, project. Eight, case, uh, eight schools in the study, four majority minority, um, and four what I would call white dominant. They were in four cities in the U.S. and South Africa. I went back to high school in each country for six months. It was agonizing, but, <laughs> but it was also interesting to be as an adult in the classroom. There was a lot I had forgotten, by the way. I conducted 57 semi-structured student group interviews with the comprising three to five students, and then I also uh, conducted a, a survey of students within each school, a random stratified sample, over 1,500 students were surveyed, and then every day in interviews with and observations of teachers and student interactions. So this is where the work uh, draws on. Let me just step back for a moment to talk about the differences between the U.S. and South Africa and why, this, why I found it interesting and why, where the convergences are and where the divergences are. 
The first thing you need to know is that there, there, there are similarities. Uh, if you think about the historical formations of those societies and the outcomes, you, you know South African history perhaps, but there are some similarities. But there are also some differences. The United States is a global superpower economically. South Africa is a middle income country, is still developing. But what was really interesting for me for a comparative uh, purpose of the incorporation of your historically disadvantaged groups is to figure out how they were going to do the process of inclusion either similarly or different when you've historically had these social and economic boundaries. And in South Africa, they immediately went to a discourse called radical inclusion. This is a country that in its constitution, when it was passed in 1994, it was considered one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, 11 national languages. Um, it was a equality uh, at that point. Um, trying to radically incorporate the schools opened rather radically as we were compared to the United States. It took decades and decades, and we still haven't quite gotten to class and, and racial integration in our schools. But this radically inclusive idea, discourse, was really about trying to bring into the fold, to the center of the African people, those who are considered colored, uh, Indian, and who are already at the center were white, the white minority. In the United States, we deal with this kind of symbolic multiculturalism. We talk about it discursively. It's nominal. It's not deep. I can say that honestly, um, but it is a kind of a kind of we, we recognize a melting pot. And if you're following what's happening in the United States in the current political moment, you can tell that the roots are not very deep around the appreciation of multiculturalism. In South Africa, it is written in their South African schools uh, the act that schools were for societal development and transformation. Uh, conversely, um, comparatively, in the United States, schools are for global and individual competitiveness. So the ideology is very much centered around individualism in the US, as opposed to a more collectivist um, um, orientation in South Africa. In terms of the racial and class discourses, you have this idea of non-racialism post-apartheid, because race was such a nefarious force. It was harmful. It was evil under apartheid. And so so they, went, they did go into the schools. When I was trying to enter as a researcher, I was actually discouraged quite a bit from not talking about race, which is such a fundamental organizing principle in the society. And the students say, what well, it governs our lives every day, but um, they don't want you to talk about it. And the outcomes in our society are very much determined by that. But there is the idea that race is a fiction, which it is. I'm a social constructionist. However, to not talk about the material consequences of a racialized formation was still problematic, and this is something I encountered. In the US, we don't have any problems. As you can see, I'm standing up here. We talk about it all the time. Um, we cannot help but talk about it, given the kinds of material uh, contours in our society. South Africa had no tracking. Initially, there were some tracks, but they completely got rid of that when they realized it was correlated to the background of the students in their uh, more resource-rich public or state schools. In the U.S., we have lots of tracking which can determine the outcomes heterogeneous um, of, of students, whether or not they're going to go to college, be college ready. That's often classed and racialized. And then there's a standardized national curriculum in South Africa. In the U.S., we have differentiated curricula, which varies by state. And so that's something that just to give you the contextual information. Let me move into the data. Um, Behind the school walls, when I talk about groupness and racial boundaries in schools, one of the major findings for this research is how students learn to reproduce social boundaries. From where they learn their places, their lines, as they say, from the real and symbolic distinctions that they see mirrored in their everyday school life, the signals that they receive from educators and other adults in schools. Here is a, an ex excerpt from an interview with a young woman named Ashley. She attended a very high-performing high school in the southern part of the United States. I uh, went back to that. I visited this school every day for about six months. Um, and I was interviewing her as a part of the study. And we were trying to get at, in the most roundabout ways without naming it, how students actually create uh, boundaries between themselves, if at all. And she said, and I quote, we have like kind of blurry lines a lot of the times. Like you have that group and you can't really relate to that group. So we know that there's a group. You can individually, so I can have my personal friend, but not like as a whole group. 
But a lot of the other groups just like they've learned their lines a lot. We have a lot of people that are in AP classes, advanced placement, these are college uh, or preparation courses, and they hang out together a lot. And then there are like the theater groups and stuff like that, and they hang out. And what we found in this particular school was that, um, one, when I went to the advanced placement, which were the upper echelon classes in this school, these were over 1,100 kids in this school, it was hard for me to see 20% of the students were African American, 80% or 70 something percent were, were white. Um, it was hard for me to actually see that representation in the advanced placement schools. I saw maybe, I counted two to three African American students across the advanced placement classes. When I went to see and participate in the extracurriculars, baseball and football were white male spaces and black male spaces, and cheerleading and stepping were white female spaces and black female spaces. So even the extracurricular activities, and what you find is something like um, where, and this is a similar, something similar happened in South Africa, where the students would actually say to me, well, you learn, I, I would like to be participating in that, but I'm not a member of that group, and I see that as, as a domain, a territory of that group. So there are these patterns which they appear to be benign. People were cordial with one another, but there are these patterns that were reproduced every day in the South African and American schools that separated the us from the them. And so the students learned their lines a lot through the types of classes they took and the kinds of activities they participated in extracurricularly, and the educators did not disrupt this because it was benign on the surface. So it's, here's just a, I'm going to go into some more in a moment, but just to tell you, in the U.S., the lines were more apparent in the two spaces I talked to you about. In South Africa, the lines of boundaries were concretized through specific culturally based codes and policies that disproportionately burdened the, um, the ethno-racial groups that were historically disadvantaged. So because South Africa didn't have tracking, you don't have the advanced placement or the upper echelon. We didn't find those kinds of lines there. We did find some in the extracurricular activities, but we mostly found it in the actual school policies and codes on the books. And one of the symbolic boundaries in South Africa was through language. Um, here, a country with 11 national languages. In this country, the most opportunity-rich, resource-rich schools that opened up post-apartheid, mostly for the middle class because you have to pay school fees and it's the middle class that can uh, uh, tend to afford to attend these schools. When African and colored and Indian students moved into these schools, they were most likely to move into schools where only two languages were privileged. Those are English and Afrikaans, as opposed to Sutu and Zulu and Tosa and Venda and so. And it was the township schools that were the opportunity poor are the resource poor schools who were, ended up being the preservers of the African language. And this is a principal who says at a, at a township schools, our school policy states that we're using English as our medium of instruction. But there is also this period that will always be dedicated to our mother tongue and that therefore we shall take English as a second language and our mother tongue as a first language. And that's how we differ as a policy from Williston High School, which was also in the study. At Willison, they would say our median is, in, is English, and our first language is English, and our second language is Afrikaans. If you understand or you're aware of South African history, then you know that this is actually also politically fraught. I mean, in the 1970s, the Soweto student uprisings were often around how students whose first tongues were Zulu or Xhosa or uh, were being forced to learn another language, oftentimes Afrikaans. Um, English is kind of the lingua franca of many of those, but taking their exams in those languages too. And so the students actually protested in the 70s, and they have, have begun to uh, push back some, but as students, particularly the middle class, as it has moved into the opportunity-rich schools, they have acculturated more. And they are privileging English because they know it's a global language, um, but it has created some, some cultural tensions between going back and forth across those borders, between the home life and the school life. So that at a place like Williston High School, which is in the study, when a student goes back and they um, have learned in their school, um, they actually, this is a very funny story that emerged, where the students have picked up the kind of cultural taste of their white peers. They like pizza. 
in the skater culture, and they've get and, and they've also picked up like their taste for rock music, and 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 when they go back to the kids who are to the neighborhood where the kids are in the township schools, those kids are eating African pies and they're da dancing quite and they have a different kind of clothing, a sartorial style. So you start to see the mesh of these different kinds of uh, cultural styles, and there are some boundaries. And consequently, the African students who are attending Williston and not Mont Johnny, which is this school, find themselves being perceived as what I've written about this phenomenon, acting white. They've assimilated. They also find themselves having some, 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 um, some cultural tension with their elders because in the Williston High School, which is the opportunity-rich school, the students are learning how a different cultural capital, so to speak. When you look at an adult, you look in the eye. That's the professional stance. In African cultures, particularly Zulu uh, closer cultures, when you're talking to, to those cultures, you're talking to an elder, they're talking to you, you actually look down. And so what I was seeing and observing day to day as an ethnographer was students that actually could get a demerit at Williston for not looking a teacher in the eye. But that's where they, they were socialized at home to do. Another thing that would happen is when African students would come to Williston from the township schools, if an elder had died, oftentimes they, the boys would have shaved their head. And it was against the hair policy in the school to, um, to actually uh, have your head show, uh, shorn if you were a boy. It was also against the cultural code of the school to wear your hair at that time in two-strand twists or braids, which many girls of African descent, myself included, would do. So this is an exchange that I had with Williston's principal um, about hair. I thought this was quite frivolous. Why would I even want it? This is not what I came to actually think about, but it emerged. These are adolescents. Have their presentation of self is very central um, to their everyday lives. And I had a group of African girls come up to me. At that time, my hair was longer. I had two strand twist. And they said, ma'am, would you talk to the school board on our behalf? Because we can't wear our hair like yours. And I was like, what? Why can't you wear your hair like mine? At that time, I was an assistant professor in sociology at Harvard. And this is what the principal said to me. Your hair must be neat and tidy. You can't be too long, no fancy hairstyles. And that's about all. We don't do dyes and color hair, dreadlocks, braiding, and all of those things. They're regarded as fancy hairstyles. So I asked, why is that fancy? Looking at her, looking the way I was. <laughs> and she said, well, because it's just not normal. And shorts and I do dyes, and they must keep it neat. I mean, if you look at them, they kind of have varying in that, so they can keep it really short if they want to. This became a continual issue um, in the school, but the schools actually varied on this. Um, and, and so here's a symbolic, what I call a symbolic boundary, which seems very innocuous and benign on the surface, that, but was actually disproportionately um, affecting the students. Palmer had a very different, this is down in the southern part of the country, another very resource-rich, opportunity-rich school, where the principal took a different uh, uh, tradition. He realized that the African youth were disproportionately burdened by this, so they actually created a separate rule for African students and white students. <laughs> and the idea was that, and I'm not going to read the full quote, well, yeah, let me do it. It's always a contentious issue, the question of hair, and what's quite interesting, particularly with open schools, is that black people have curly hair. Now, in the closer tradition, your traditional closer boy should have his hair cut short as possible. That's a sign of respect. If a white boy cuts his hair short, it's a sign of being a punk. <laughs> so he's now making a statement, whereas the closer boy is not. And it's almost as though you've got different rules for blacks and whites, which creates a few problems. Then there's the question of braiding. Now, it used to be that only females braided their hair, but now the boys think that it's quite cool to braid their hair. And this school is the one of the few schools that allow the boys to braid their hair. It looks neat as long as it's neat and tidy, not sort of Bob Marley sort of style. It's got to be neat and tidy. And so he had told me that white kids can't wear braids, and I asked that again. He says, white kids know, which is very strange. Our rule says that if your hair supports the braid on its own, you can have the braid. So we don't allow that because then you got this kind of Christmas tree effect in the court. And so here, I know it's, it's funny, it's comical, but he was drawing on a biological and phenotypical definition of braids. Your hair can hold naturally. If you have kinky hair like my own, it can hold naturally, then you could do it. This is so we're going to take that into account. 
that's, but we're going to create these separate rules for this. So that was a categorization where you create these exclusions, these differential things, yes. The third um, form of race and inequality is embedded in the idea systems, and that's an idea system. Um, but I want to talk to you about another idea system that emerged in this research. And this is back in the United States at a very opportunity-rich high school that had been desegregating for 40 years. And what's embedded in this quote is a group of boys who are talking to me. The system doesn't encourage us to interact. Think about it. Why should you interact, says another. Why do we need to be encouraged? Judah, who became my muse, because the VDP, the Voluntary Desegregation Program, is not just about coming out to suburban schools, doing the homework, and going back to our homes. It's about teaching suburban students what it's like to live in the inner city, what's it feel like to be a person of color. Jarvis says, I thought the purpose was just to come out and get a good education. Marcus and Jonathan agree. Judah, no, it's not that. It, that's the main purpose, but, but the other purpose is to teach each other what we have to offer. I'm referring to like the intangibles, not whether or not you can reiterate the facts that teachers are teaching you, not whether you can memorize a math equation or a scientific formula. I'm talking about character, strength, integrity, and how we relate to other people, how we identify with other people in our creativity. Those are the things that I feel are not being valued enough in the school system, the way the system is structured. They focus solely on, you know, what grades you get, and I think that doesn't do us much justice. It's a 15-year-old who said that. What he refers to, and what I, as I uh, was actually in engaging and doing the analysis, is how we have utilized education as a private good to foment and, pro and continue to propagate the system. Um, of inequality that we have in American society. So David Lavery, my former colleague, has written this article that talks about three kind of ideological discourses about education's functions and purposes. The social efficiency model is the one the economists often use about cultivating human capital, preparing workers. The social mobility, market, mo mobility perspective is about preparing us to compete for social status and resources. It's the one that's the most dominant in our society. The democratic equality one is the one you might see less, but it's one that was in the hit. It's, it's actually in the kind of origins of how we thought about education, but it's about developing citizens. It's about actually diminishing those boundaries that we talk about, civic engagement, and that's what Judah was talking about. And we didn't see very much evidence of the democratic equality with some more evidence of the social mobility, the competition fomenting, propagating, creating and reproducing the boundaries so that you would hoard the opportunity resources for your group as opposed to redistributing them. I'm almost out of time, but I will say quickly to you that one of the things that I tried to understand in this process is the extent to which different school settings shaped different ways of being or influence different ways, what I call cultural and social uh, flexibility for students. How were their ideas similar or different about crossing boundaries? Being with kids who were a different gender, ethnicity, who spoke a different language, had different cultural tastes. So I developed a scale that I used that had a high um, alpha. And this nine um, item scale actually showed different results depending on the school context. And I ran some, uh, some regression analysis, and what I will tell you from that scale is the attitudes and preferences for same race, same SES peers which were correlated negatively with cultural flexibility. So the more you prefer kids like yourself, the less culturally flexible you were, the, lo the lower you performed on the cultural flexibility scale. In the study, we also found that kids who were in the more academically rigorous courses that had a lot of innovation and creativity in them, they tended to score more highly on the cultural flexibility scale. The students among black students, the students who were in the majority minority schools actually fared better than the students who were in the desegregated schools. And I can tell you why that is. The boundaries were so deep and so thick and palpable in those schools that banned and orchestra and, and chorus were not perceived as of them. Whereas in majority minority schools, you saw kids across the spectrum in academic programs and in extracurricular programs. And so we also saw some regional differences. So how do we get to radical inclusion in, in schools? I love this quote from Lynn Barton, who's, one, who's a British researcher who does, um, as you know, uh, he was at the University of London, about inclusive education. He focused on disabled students. But I, this is the one thing that I have been trying to figure out as a policy level, as we try to uh, diminish the practices in schools that impede 
the deeper incorporation of historically disadvantaged groups. Schooling is ultimately about the transformation of a society in its formal institutional arrangements. And this means changes in the values, priorities, and policies that support and perpetuate practices of exclusion and discrimination. There, there's the quote that this is from um, the World of Your Book of Education. Some of the schools were working on this. They were trying intentional. They were being very intentional about brown boundary, uh, breaking down boundaries. They had programs. Students went off for the weekends. They, um, they crossed. They, they, they integrated with one another. And that actually created some tension back at home because their parents, and this is in South Africa, who were the products and the babies of apartheid, still maintain rather rigid ideas about other. These kids were actually going through processes where they were being deconditioned and re-socialized. And, how, and this young woman, Danielle, talks about how she challenges a new fr a friend of hers about how she talks about Penny because Penny is black. That program actually helped her to facilitate new ideas about thinking about the black children who were coming into this school. So I'll end on this. Why the sociocultural structures, uh, structures of schooling deserve attention? It's not just about achievement outcomes. We measure test, 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 test all over the U.S., um, South Africa. Access to strong material resources, I argue in my work, is necessary, but it is not sufficient as we think about the reduction of inequality. Those intangible, hard-to-measure sociocultural and political dynamics matter to how well students are going to be connected and engaged in schools, social and symbolic boundaries within some schools, influence the movement of students across the spaces and even into higher education, and the nature and substance of status dynamics and intergroup uh, group relations in schools have long-term social, civic, and economic consequences for our societies, as other sociologists and social scientists have found. So from the macro, meso to the micro, we have to think about these three dimensions from shared and economic political power, deepening the opportunities at the material level, deepening and expanding our social networks. What are the mechanisms that we can do that? And then even thinking and interrogating our understanding of what education's purpose is um, and how we deal with multiculturalism and diverse identities in the order to erase prejudice and bias in schools. These are acknowledgments for those who have supported this research. I had a team of undergrad um, researchers across my various university affiliations and support from uh, various places. Thank you very much for your listening. Thanks so much, Prudence. That was a really, really interesting talk. Uh, so we do have time for some questions now. So if you would like to pick up on something, please raise your hand. And I, I will also probably try to reduce and probably rather crudely simplify your question. I hope I don't get it wrong. But uh, we need to do that for the people who are uh, online. So first question. Uh, Paul Ashwin, Lancaster University. Um, thanks, that. that was fascinating and really engaging. Um, <clears throat> I was just interested in whether you had any sense of the role that knowledge and curriculum played in relation to students' experiences and whether there was anything about the knowledge they're engaging in schools that actually um, also played into the processes that you were talking about. Yes, yes. Um, and that, that, come, that, has, that comes up, um, that comes up uh, in, in, in some of the chapters that I've written about who's on the syllabus or who's in the curriculum in terms of how, what we're reading and what does it signify. And so um, under the accountability era in the United States particularly, it's been a big deal to uh, be, have these standardized uh, curriculum and, um, and it, that's very much oftentimes determined by teachers. But students themselves in the day-to-day -day in the interviews with us actually talked about how they struggled with whether or not this stuff really mattered in their real lives and who was represented. So representation matters and that came up for students in the data, in the, in the interview studies. In the South African context, similarly, I, a lot of that came up around how language was taught, how language ensued in schools. Um, because South Africa was trying to be radically inclusive, that their curriculum post-apartheid with the passage of the South African Schools Act was already radically changing and being more inclusive. So they were getting some of that um, that they wouldn't have gotten prior to 94. In the US, there's still some grappling with it and still some talk about, you know, I know Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and history, but I know there's more than that. And what else could there be? And so I would get that from students. Yeah, uh, yeah at the back, and then. Oh, thank you. My name is Nicholas Wadengira from the University of Chelsea in Berlin. I was very happy to hear your talk from 
a lot of people will do because it's of interest in their range it, uh, but from a non-academic setting. So it was very pleasing to hear from an academic setting. So my question, maybe it relates also to my knowledge of the topic, is that I know that EF, a political party in South Africa, is sort of playing the role of a police officer on the issues that you're saying. Because I know, for example, some schools that have problems, that have been violated, the, 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 the students have no one to go, no, no one to report to, so they report to EFF. EFF is sort of a red for uh, political party. So EFF goes to that schools and addresses some of those, those issues. So I, what's your view from, a, from an academic perspective or from a solution perspective to the problem that you, you violated that a political party is playing a role of a, sort of a police officer? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, when I conducted this research in the, uh, uh, the, from 2004 to 11, um, what I, and I was giving some part of this in the early stages of talks at a conference in South Africa, and the Minister of Education, someone from the ministry was in the room, and he came up to me and he said, you know that's against the Constitution. You know some of that stuff is illegal, right? And I said, so the first things first is that people are not aware of some of the things that they should be doing. Um, and it's to, to familiarize and actually push, if it's behind the school walls and nobody's reporting it, um, if they are uncomfortable with it, then there's no change, there's no pressure to change the law or to change the policy. So part of that is just informing. Now, I'm not familiar with the kind of red police, so to speak, the EFF and going into the schools. I, what I am familiar with is that at the time I was in the field, um, it was even the case where there was some trans, uh, cultural transmission of taste, and I remember reading in the Johannesburg Times about an affluent young white woman who had gone on vacation with her parents to Mad uh, somewhere in the Caribbean, or maybe it was Madagascar, I can't remember, but she had braided her hair like Bo Derek from 10 back in the, I don't know, some of you may be too young, and she got sanctioned by her private school for bring, coming, bringing that high school, that, that there. Now, people have pushed me and said, you understand that this is steeped in older, and actually people said you have to understand the British model of education, you understand the, the uniforms and the way. And so this is really just a cultural transmission. What I'm saying is that there is incongruence or there's, a, there's, there's a, right now, there's cultural mismatch and tension when you map that onto a society that is as ethnically diverse as South Africa. And students themselves use their bodies as sites of protest and resistance. So um, I'm not surprised if it's gotten bad enough that you could get thrown out of school, you can get three demerits or exposed from school because you cut your hair. Or, and, and it's a really, for me, I'm trying not to impose, be, and impose my American logic on it, but when I'm told that I'm not normal, and I'm actually one of the most, uh, you know, teach at, teach at one of the world's most elite universities at that time, and I have my hair like that, and so those girls saw that as legitimate. So how do you deal with this kind of cultural messiness across global lives and students are picking these things up? But to answer your question, I'm not familiar that familiar with what's going on now. I do know that people thought it was problematic and that it needed to be attended to. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, Thank you, Yanya Kuyumi from Lancaster. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder about the connection or rather disconnection of the three levels, micro, mm -hmm. meso, and micro and their relationality. So if on the one hand you have different systems of what education is for, so collective versus individual and competitive, how can you then build specific socio-cultural systems at the micro level that would benefit the disconnection if that's desired in terms of social justice? So the argument is actually that you have to settle on one, the democratic equality one, if you really want to ameliorate the historical conditions. So the social mobility uh, discourse is the one we are seeped in, we live in, and it's, it's really pre reproducing the kind of unequal economic, political, social system that we have. So the, the Lavery's work is not one where he, he tries to be a little bit more agnostic and just to show where the tensions are. I actually argue based on my research, the implication is that we need to move towards a more democratic equal, equal um, society in terms of our discourse about what education's purpose are, uh, purposes are. Because what's happening in the United States right now with the opportunity hoarding, it is just this widening the chasm, the gulf between those who've been historically disadvantaged and those who are advantaged and privileged today. And we don't see any way that that's going to change um, unless we actually recalibrate. 
And, and so some of that means that you have to think about how you include and share um, in a society where um, there are finite resources in some cases, and there are infinite resources, and we are a wealthy country. We have enough to take care of everyone. Um, so I think it, my argument is unless mindsets set shift, we'll be talking about this for another 50 to 100 years. We'll just be reproducing. We'll have more people in the room like us looking at these questions. And actually, I'm trying to work myself out of a job um, <laughs> around this. I'd like to do something else. But I think if we, if we don't think about the recalibration at the idea level, the actual, how that actually shapes how people think about residential uh, uh, housing, the um, establishments of schools, the actual curriculum, and then all of those different other processes will just be where we are. So it's not about creating tripartite or multiple ones. It's about trying to figure out which is the best for the advancement of social, for social progress. Yeah, I mean, I think a fascinating tool. I mean, it's quite troubling in lots of ways because you, you kind of show all, all the complexities of, of what people are trying to do with different things. So, I mean, 40 years ago in, in the UK, they thought if you got rid of tracking in primary schools, that this would produce, you know, would produce equality. I think what you're showing is whether you have academic tracking or not, you always have this cultural tracking and you have this social tracking, which still sits there. And, and so, unless we can find ways of getting rid of that, we actually don't make any progress. And that, that seems to be the message. I mean, I'm not sure if I'm missing that somewhere, but because actually just getting rid of one form of tracking simply produces it somewhere else. So then you've got to think, well, how do you actually create a space where that kind of tracking doesn't happen? Right. That, I mean, I don't know if there probably isn't an answer to that, because if somebody had an answer, they would probably be trying it. So what I'm, you, you're right, and it is, I say that multidimensional problems of inequality, there is, the problem of inequality is multidimensional. We spend a lot of time on the material, the socioeconomic, which is why I say schools comprise that domain, but these more intangible, harder sociocultural processes have to be focused on too, because it's those attitudes that fuel how we structure schools materially in many ways. And so it's, in, in cultural sociologists, those of us who spend time on those micro-level processes don't get to, that doesn't get infused in policy. And increasingly, we're bringing it into teacher education practice. We're trying to conscientize teacher, uh, in-service teachers, but it's a hard climb. It's a hard climb. But what I'm suggesting is this is where we have to go in tandem with the material differences, too, if we really want to radically uh, advance our society. So it's illuminating another dimension. Yeah. Right. Prudence, thank you so much for that um, marvelous talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Sure. Um, uh, early in your talk, you mentioned that South Africa did away with tracking. It's related mm -hmm. to the question um, that was just raised. I wonder if you could provide some additional historical context um, for that, mm -hmm. um, largely because in both the US and UK, um, throughout my research, I found that tracking remains a normative and explicitly accepted mode of inequality, mm -hmm. uh, so much so that it's difficult to imagine schooling without tracking. Um, but here's this context where they were able to make a decision um, right. about uh, getting rid of tracking uh, for the advancement of society or to move us more closely towards that democratic equality model. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could provide that historical context and perhaps some explicit examples of how U.S. and U.K. societies could move away from tracking. Right. Okay. So first, in South Africa, they had what were called higher grade and lower grade um, uh, tracks when I first arrived there. And I, I've been going for over a decade. Um, and I can't tell you exactly what year, but when I first started my research, the higher grade, lower grade tracks were there. Mm -hmm. Within a couple of years, they had disappeared. And I think they realized, is one with a standardized national curriculum where, in theory, all students at the same grade level across the country should be getting the same information being taught, um, that you wouldn't have that correlation which ones were going to be on the college going track and which were going to be, you know, going into vocational track. Mm -hmm. So they, they did, um, and the South African Schools Act was being, revised continually. This is a budding, a fledgling democracy, and the educators were being, their ideas, the, the influence, the knowledge and curriculum was coming from across the globe, and what were lessons learned from other societies. So they were watching us. Mm -hmm. They were watching the UK, and so that information does uh, um, um, come across. So they got rid of it. Um, now, be quick. what happens is that, you know, in the South African context, the material basis really is so strongly overdetermined because to get into higher education, even if you pass the exams, can you afford it, mm -hmm. right? And your family is so poor. So that's when it all comes um, back. 
But to, to the, your case about the U.S., we actually have, there are anti-tracking movements that have uh, emerged in school districts across. There are over 17,000 school districts in the United States. And in Long Island, New York, for example, there is a principal who's led a movement where they have detracked and they have, the expectations for all students is great. We have a culture in the U.S. where it's expected that if you graduate from high school that you're going to college. That the, the college degree is what the, the high school degree was in 1950s, right? And so that was part of the logic. Um, we're going to have high expectations for all of our students, and there have been case studies done on this district where they show actually very good returns to that practice um, and that policy. What's stunning and striking to me about this study, I didn't give you all the details methodologically, is that the students of color in my resource-rich white dominant schools or from the same class background as the students of color within the majority minority schools. The students in the majority minority schools where the expectations were high and they were also had tracking within their schools, more of them were going off and aspiring to colleges, universities, um, but they also talked and interrogated that the boundaries for the kids in the regular classes versus the, so they had problems too. Um, but because of the different um, formations, the kind of ethos being different, more of those kids felt like it was expected of them to go to college. Go to my other schools, which were resource-rich white dominant schools. I mean, you know, the school where 40 years, a Judah school, um, I went back after he was, a, went, uh, went, after I finished the study and he was going into senior year, there were about 100 black kids in this school who were seniors and only four were going to college. 98% of the kids in that school go to college. They go on to the most resource-rich, highly selective universities in the, college, in the country. What was happening differentially? So that you had kids from very similar backgrounds having radically different, and that's where I say this, the, the ethos of the school matters a lot to the outcomes for those students. Um, and that was another really telling moment for me. But there are movements. It's a political challenge because the privilege I know it's a form of institutional cultural capital. Um, the way our <coughs> higher education system is structured, it privileges that. And if you want that advantage, you, you, why get rid of it? So it is a system that has to be disrupted at multiple points. Which is a great moment on which to finish. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, online participants, I do hope you uh, were able to understand those questions. I apologize. I was going to repeat them all, but I... I didn't, so I hope you, you got that. Um, so, again, thank you very, very much to Prudence. Thank you. Really fascinating.